Thank you so sorry. much. And if no, you can, sorry about that. Please make my still shot the host so I can share my computer screen. Okay. Okay, now you should be the host again. Did you hit record, Carrie? I did. Okay, great. Okay, so Mitch, I think you're up. Mitch, is there, is everything working? I apologize, I lost the uh, connection momentarily. I've seen a lot of pigeons in town. We could put them back into play. All right. So I had to adjust the settings to allow me to share this. Can everybody see the screen now? Yes. Yep. All right. Yes. Apologize for the, <laughs> the delay and the difficulties here. So as Carrie said, um, Mitch Patachik from GGLO, um, we're um, urban planners, architects, landscape uh, architects and interior designers um, who are um, working uh, um, with city staff, Nick and Carrie and others to uh, conduct a sub area plan and plan action EIS for the downtown uh, and government county campus in Port Orchard. Uh, as uh, Carrie said, Rich Schapansky from EA is also uh, on here and I will hand it over to him in a little while to talk more about our primary purpose of this meeting, which is to solicit your input and input from other members of the community regarding the EIS scoping. Um, other team members, uh, consultant team members that uh, you may see here that are going to be helping us with this project include uh, Hartland, who's already completed a economic profile for Port Orchard, as well as a um, baseline buildable lands analysis of the existing sub area. So um, just to give a, a high level overview to everybody that's on here, um, I know the planning commission's well aware of the project, but just for anyone on the line that's not, um, there's two primary components of this project. One is the sub area plan for the downtown and county government campus. Um, key aspects of the sub area plan is to assess existing conditions, including the economic profile, housing capacity, um, facilitate community engagement, uh, prepare preliminary development concepts to increase uh, housing supply within the sub area, um, develop and refine proposed alternatives, and then 
assist the staff, city to prepare um, implementation strategies. Uh, the second aspect of this of our of the project is the planned action EIS, um, which I'll let Rich uh, talk to you about um, in a little bit here. So the initial vision for this project is to establish a vibrant urban center that is economically feasible and contact sensitive. And I will just note here, um, urban center has a lot of different meanings to different people. And of course, this the main focus here is that contact sensitive because an urban center means a different thing depending on what the context of that is. Initial project objectives include establishing the vision for the urban center, uh, increasing housing uh, consistent with the goals of the uh, House Bill 213. I think I'm blanking on the number. It's text and show up, right? Um, focus growth and designated centers to support residential living in walkable neighborhoods, involve the public in the planning and design process, include accessible public open space, increase multimodal connectivity, um, including the plan action EIS to reduce barriers and define uh, mitigation strategies um, for economic development and accommodate regional growth um, as Port Orchards is proposed high capacity transit community under the Puget Sound Regional Council uh, Vision 2050. So looking at the boundary of the study area, it's primarily focused on the downtown and county campus as defined in the city's 2016 comp plan. Um, the, uh, through collaboration with city staff and PSRC guidance, uh, we evaluated four different uh, study area alternatives, um, looking at a more holistic um, and broader uh, boundary beyond the existing county campus in downtown and settled on what is shown in the dashed red lines here. Um, I just note that while the study area is quite extensive, it's 329 acres, uh, changes will not be proposed necessarily in all areas uh, within the study area boundary. Um, the boundary was defined um, to better allow for a more holistic approach to our planning and also to uh, provide the strongest basis for potential future uh, regional centers application with PSRC. Uh, within this overall study area, the intended uh, areas that would be targeted for redevelopment include the existing urban centers, um, which we've split the downtown um, for discussion purposes into West Downtown, which is the historic downtown and Main Street and East Downtown. Uh, centered on the intersection of Bethel and Bay Street. Um, and then the county government campus with the primary component there being the expand, planned expansion for the county campus. Um, other potential redevelopment areas are those identified in the buildable lands analysis as underutilized uh, parcels for development. Uh, a quick snapshot of the project timeline. Um, we started working with the city um, at the beginning of this year. And while the original plan was to hold our initial uh, public workshop and uh, open house in late April or early May, um, we've all learned to adapt and have had to change plans due to the existing on ongoing COVID pandemic. Um, while we did slow the project for time this spring, we're now moving forward um, with input being based on online surveys as well as um, outreach efforts such as this meeting. And um, there will be additional opportunities for input later this fall. Um, that will include um, the review of the draft EIS and sub area plan alternatives as well as public input opportunities on the final preferred plan and final EIS. City staff will also conduct a public hearing in early 2021 to review the plan action ordinance. 
Um, we did hold our initial public outreach uh, prior to this meeting that took place um, from June 8th to July 24th, and we received 71 responses on the initial uh, public survey. And while comments and responses were diverse, some of the key themes to note from that initial public survey um, was a desire to enhance the existing waterfront open space, um, encourage development to uh, turn to face the waterfront, um, concerns that new development should be of a scale and character that's consistent with the existing uh, neighborhood contacts, of course, concerns related to uh, parking, primarily um, in the current downtown core. Um, concerns regarding safety and security at the existing parks and open space and increased improvements for multimodal connections throughout the study area, including pedestrian, bicycle, vehicle, and transit connections. With that said, I will uh, turn it over to Rich and uh, he will uh, go over the EIS process. Um, and Rich, let me know if you want me to advance this or if you want to take over. Um, I'll let you go ahead and do that, Mitch, probably okay. easier. <laughs> <laughs> and if you couldn't get that to work right away, it would take me forever. So I think we'll go that way. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Rich Shapansky. I'm with EA Engineering, and we're working with the city and GGLO on um, preparing the EIS for the sub area plan. And, Could you define uh, EIS? Pardon me? Could you define EIS? Yes, I was. Good question. I was just going to do that. Um, EIS is Environmental Impact Statement. And an environmental impact statement is required for projects in the state of Washington that meet a certain threshold uh, under the State Environmental Policy Act or SEPA. And uh, the, the main intent of the EIS is to provide uh, uh, an impartial um, identification of impacts that could occur under a project, identify mitigation for impacts and identify significant impacts that cannot be mitigated. Um, and the purpose, the first phase of the EIS process is scoping, which is where we are right now. And the intent of scoping is to focus the EIS to those elements of the environment, and I'll talk about those in a second, that have the highest potential for significant impacts. Uh, and to identify reasonable alternatives. Um, so on this first slide here, and I think Carrie mentioned these at the beginning of the meeting, but at this point, um, and, and just to step back a little bit, the, also the purpose of scoping is to get feedback from the community and tribes and other agencies on what the EIS should look at. And uh, there is a public scoping time are open to be received to look at three alternatives you can see on the slide. Alternative one is no action, which is what would occur if there were no, um, and I just, so you know, I'm getting a note that says my internet connection is unstable. So if I, if I block out, that's why it is, but hopefully I'll stay on here. Hey Rich, can you talk about 45 seconds? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I, I just mentioned that I had a note that said uh, that my internet is unstable. So um, I'll give it my best shot. So uh, I identified why we're doing an EIS and what an EIS is um, and why we're here now. Scoping is the first phase of the EIS process where we're eliciting comments from the public and uh, interested tribes and agencies on what will be analyzed in the EIS. And that scoping period uh, where the city will be taking comments runs through uh, September 4th. Um, so what we're anticipating looking at at this point, uh, and that won't be finalized until after the scoping period is concluded, uh, for the EIS is we're anticipating looking at three alternatives. The first alternative is a no action, 
which will act as the baseline for the identification of impacts. And the no action indicates there'd be no new policies or guidelines associated with the sub area plan. It doesn't mean there wouldn't be growth downtown. It just means there wouldn't be the plans and policies that could be adopted under the sub area plan. Alternative two is uh, on development under the sub area plan with a residential focus. And alternative three looks at a higher capacity. Is everyone else hearing him? Because we've lost him. Uh oh. Can you guys hear me okay? I can hear no. Rich. I'm I, not hearing him at I, all. Okay. Um, well, it could be my internet connection is not great. Um, maybe what we could do, Mitch, if you could hear me, if you could read <laughs> what's on the slides, because if people aren't hearing me, it, it's not going to do. And then, then maybe you could, um, at the end of a slide, ask me if there's anything that I should add. Would that work? I just want to make sure people can hear us. Mitch, you're muted. Yeah, I can try that, Rich. I'm okay, so, sorry about that, guys. I, I don't know what happened to my connection here. So to, to pick, up, pick up where to completion of the scoping process that will be um, reviewed and evaluated include uh, land use, the relationship to plans and policies, land use, and relationships at the state, county, city, and relevant um, existing plans and policies. Uh, reviewing- Sorry uh, to interrupt. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is Greek to a lot of people online. This is not the way to do it when you're doing a major change at Port Orchard. I'm sorry, could, could you please let um, Mitch finish and then if you have questions he will take those questions at the end of the presentation thank you the second element um, that will be evaluated is planned to be evaluated includes population and employment potentially increase in, popu in, in population and employment um, also housing potential housing increases uh, we'll review aesthetics and visual resources, including compatibility with the existing context, views, light, and glare of new development. Uh, transportation impacts, including motorized and non-motorized transportation, such as pedestrian and bicycles. Uh, public surface, services, including uh, police, fire management, medical services, and schools. And the last item, is utilities, including stormwater, sanitary sewer, and water service to serve the proposed new developments. Anything else, Rich? No, that's, uh, that's good. And, and those elements will be analyzed for each of the alternatives identified for the EIS, one, two, and three. Can we hear Rich now, or do you want me to continue? Well, let, let me try, Mitch, and if I cut out, somebody tell me, and uh, Mitch, you can take over. Um, so, uh, you know, again, stepping back on what is an EIS, an EIS is a, a document to disclose what potential impacts could be of an action. And here we're talking about the sub-area plan, and we're going to look at the potential impacts under those elements of the environment that Mitch described. We'll look at, you know, what are the heights of potential buildings? How would those be viewed from areas? What impacts will there be on police and schools? What will increased demand be on utilities? So that's what the EIS is going to look at, identify those impacts, and then identify mitigation where it's warranted. Uh, so um, that's what an EIS is, and it's, all, it's a tool for the city and for the agencies to uh, help evaluate a, a project. Um, and the, I think Mitch and Carrie both mentioned that it's a planned action EIS and the intent of a planned action is to identify those impacts in the planning stage. So where we are now. So 
we're going to take a holistic look and look at what the potential could be for development under these alternatives in a, in a very holistic way so that uh, it would I encompass individual projects as they were to come along later. Um, and the focus again of this scoping meeting is to provide, co get comments, first of all, to inform the public of what the project is and what the SEPA process is, to receive comments and comments can be received tonight. I believe there'll be an opportunity to verbally provide comments as well as comments can be provided by email or, or mail um, through September 4th. And the um, email address and address is all provided on the determination of significance. And I'm sure you know that can be shown here at some point. So everybody has a copy of where you know they can send those comments. I believe they're also uh, the determination of significance is also on the city's website, if I'm correct on that, Carrie. <laughs> And um, Mitch, if you can go to the last slide, this is just a uh, kind of a schedule just to show where we are in the process. And we talked about the DS, the determination of significance, which is the first um, box there, which is where we are, which is where we're eliciting comments on what people want to see analyzed in the EIS, see you know what people think of the alternatives that we're looking at. Um, after the end of the scoping period, uh, there will be a summary of the comments received and what the uh, EIS will look at. Uh, the first milestone in the EIS process is the issuance of a draft EIS. And that will be issued, I believe, in the schedule that um, Mitch showed earlier, it would be toward the end of the year. And when that document is issued, and it's going to show analysis of all those elements we talked about, land use, aesthetics, public services, transportation. There will be a 30-day comment period where uh, the public <coughs> and agencies and tribes can review the document and provide comments on that document as well. And I, and I believe there'll be a public meeting somewhere in the middle of that 30-day comment period. And then based on those comments, a final EIS will be prepared. And if there's any additional analysis that needs to be provided, that will be provided in the final, as well as every comment that's received during the draft will be responded to individually in the final EIS. So um, hopefully that's clear and hopefully you can hear me, uh, but that in a nutshell is the, the EIS process and, wh and why we're here tonight for scoping. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Carrie. And I believe the next item on the agenda is for the opportunity for public comment. But just please bear with me until I get this turned back over. Or um, Mitch, do you want to keep being the host during the public comment period in case you have to go back to any of the slides to refer to a point? Yeah, that's fine. You can do that. I don't know if somebody from the city is... is um, moderating or how you're opening up the, the public comment. Uh, so at this time we'll open up for public comment. Is there anyone that would like to comment on the project or have any questions? I would. Go ahead and state your name please and your address. My name is Jerry Harmon 906 Kitsap Street and this is involving a lot of people between Klein and the high school, yet very few people know a thing about this. I got a letter, but nobody else in my group got a letter about this meeting. So this is a process that I think has really got the cart before the horse. As far as all of you in government may know a heck of a lot about it and your friends that are associated 
but the rest of us are blind about all that's going on here. And I really think that there needs to be lots, not just one, lots of meetings that bring people from the community. Why did I get a letter and nobody else around me got a letter announcing this Zoom meeting? It seems like everybody on this hillside from Klein to the high school should have received a notification about this presentation. And they didn't. So they don't know what in the world is going on with our city. During a pandemic, you need to be more open to the people. Government does not have a good position with the public. And this is an example of why. And I know it costs money. I've been to a lot of council meetings. And every time they send out, it takes from the budget. But this is important to the people of Port Orchard. And you need to make sure that everybody is aware of what is happening. Like the meeting you had, you said you had an information meeting. I didn't know anything about an information meeting. And the other thing, I started to answer the survey and it was late at night. And in previous surveys, I could go back. Then the next day I couldn't get back into the survey to do write any written comments. So I just filled out, you know, pick the right button. So that was something on that survey that was out there and it wouldn't let me back in. So it was an incomplete. I don't even know if it got, you know, counted, counted. because it wouldn't let me back in to respond. So anyway, I've got lots of questions, but my number one is who is really driving this right now? Are there developers out there? Some of us have been talking, we're getting letters from developers right now wanting to buy all of our homes. Do they know all about this and we're in the dark? These are questions, lots of questions, and I would lay odds that other people have questions also, but my number one concern is you're planning based on the um, P, oh, having Puget a seat. Sound. Puget Sound Regional Council is like, they're the driving force for all of us. And it should be the people here be the driving force of what happens to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie, um, that's a question for you. Do you know who got who the information went out to? Was it all of the local addresses or? Um, the notice was mailed out by our consultants, but my understanding is that it went out to everybody within. And hear you, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. So one, one thing to make this better is if everybody turns off their camera and just listens, sometimes that helps the, the audio. So I don't know if anybody's willing to do that, but and then you're going to speak and then you could come back on. But if you turn your cameras off, we should have a better connection. I'll turn my camera off if that will help. Okay, thank you. Can people hear me now? Yes. Okay. So the notices were you sent out. Yes. You can't hear me? You can. Okay. I can, I can hear you, Carrie. I can hear you fine, Carrie. I think that's their connection. Okay. I'm just going to continue speaking. Um, I can hear. Okay. Thank you. So the notices were sent out to everybody who is within the current designated centers of downtown and the county campus, plus the expanded study areas, which are noted on the map, which were pointed out by the consultants tonight, plus an additional 800 foot boundary outside of those areas. And the addresses um, to uh, send those notices were obtained from the Kitsap County Assessor's Office. So those, were pro those would be no more than 60 days old. Okay. Uh, I, my name is Anna Harmon at 824 Kitsap Street. My husband and I did not get notification and sitting next to me is... My name is Kimberly Phillips. I've been at 905 DeKalb Street. My family has been there for over 90 years. I did not get a letter. <laughs> and our next door neighbor up behind us, Nolan... What's Nolan's last name? Larson. No. Nolan Larson did not get a uh, notification either. Okay, please um, send me your contact information. 
at planning at city of port orchard us and I will be sure to add you to our email list for all further communications and notices. But you just said you sent it to everyone that you got I'm a, I vote every time there's an election. Uh, all my information is current. It the mailers are sent to property owners as listed on the assessor. Um, we don't, there is no database if, if somebody happens to rent for getting a hold of them. Um, oh, it, it we're, we're, all, we're, we're, all, we're all owners for 40 years. We all own our property. We will look into it. It's possible that the post office is having an issue, but the, the notices have been going out for uh, all the actions that the department does and it's usually a big long mailing list and a stack of postcards that go out actually nick this would have been a um letter a letter in, or a two-page mailer a double-sided inside an envelope so this was not a postcard mail out oh thank you well there's something significantly wrong if there's so many of us that own our property in the downtown area that did not get notification of the meeting or what you guys are doing. I agree. And if that is an issue, whether that's with the mail or with the county assessor's records as they're being given to us, I want to make sure that doesn't happen again. So, you know, my apologies, first of all, that you didn't get noticed, but to make sure that doesn't happen again, if you would, please, um, anyone who's out there, not, not just you, Ms. Harmon, but anyone else that this has happened to, please send me your contact info, planning at cityofportorchard.us, and I will make sure to email you personally all notices from now on. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, moving on, is there anybody else that has some questions or comments? Um, hi, my name is Michael Hendrickson. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I live at 1016 Kitsap Street. Um, and I was here today just kind of get some inf more information. Um, I did have a question about the downtown sub area plan um, economic profile and capacity an analysis. Um, there's this page 33 and it has these areas marked off as area of concern and high ha hazard. I was seeing if I could get some more context to that. Um, I think quite understand how to interpret that. Is there someone going to answer his question? Mitch, do you want to respond to that, please? Yes, yeah, so the, the areas of the concern and high hazard areas are areas that are um, defined um, uh, by the city or the county as either being in um, primarily in uh, existing um, uh, stream or waterfront corridors or areas of um, poor soil um, items such as that. I believe those are actually the geologically hazardous areas as mapped yeah in our critical areas mapping. So if you're on a slope that's more than, I think it's 15%, that shows up as a geologically hazardous area. And so uh, typically the assumptions for development potential in those areas are more limited. Okay. Um, so the, the, the idea is that there probably won't be any development per this plan in these areas. Or a lower under, potential. Under the city's critical areas code, you can develop on geologically hazardous areas if you prepare a geotechnical report that shows that the development can be safely installed in accordance with geotechnical engineering recommendations. So typically you're going to have to sink piles um, into the, the hillside to ensure stability. And, and if, the, if the area is unstable, the geotech is not going to recommend building there, in which case uh, you won't have a report that says it can be safely constructed. So it really varies from site to site on what can actually take place depending on the stability of the slope. Okay. And just to, I pulled up the page you're referencing, and for the purposes of our buildable lands analysis, 
uh, we had used a deduction to account for the challenges of developing on those parcels. For instance, areas of high hazard, we essentially deducted 75% uh, of the parcel area, assuming that that area would be challenging to develop and for areas of concern, deducted 50% of the parcel area. Um, okay. Um, and then kind of going back to that page, um, you have a lot of areas that are residential areas marked for kind of a development. What does that mean for the residences like on the exact map spots? Again? Can you show that map again of what we're talking about on the slide? It shows the, the east and west downtown and all that, because that's what we're talking about. I can. Thank you. Yeah, that one. Yeah, it's a similar page, but it has um, a different key for the map. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm Pat and um, I live at 1710 Guy Wetzel. Uh, near, not far from the high school. In could the you, could you provide your last name, please? I'm sorry. Oh, my, my last name is Moriarty. It's the icon with the cartoon face there. Um, Thank you. I, I, uh, I live near, near the high school on Guy Wetzel. Um, I want to ask about the east downtown area that's marked off in blue there. Um, is there any eminent domain going on with this project? There is none proposed as part of this project, no. Okay. Also, I, I, uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Because um, my my concern is is similar, and that is that um, what is proposed for residences in these um, areas that are they're currently a residence. Um, some of the maps I've seen have my actual property designated as commercial. Can, can we hold off just a second and go back and let Pat finish and then we'll move on to you, please? Yeah, sorry oh, about that. Oh, that's fine. Oh, uh, sorry. My, my, my only question concerned like was, was there any eminent domain going on in any of these areas? And I guess my, my only other concern is uh, if there is construction going on, like how tall are we talking here that might obstruct uh, any views from the neighborhoods. So, um, Pat, most of the most of the hillsides above downtown are in an area that is designated designated as a view protection overlay district, and so there are height restrictions in place in the code already. And I don't believe that we are proposing to change those where views exist. Um, the heights in the downtown vary from three to five stories, depending on where you are. And all of the downtown height limits are based on, um, are, are, are tried, trying to minimize view impacts. And so um, I don't know that a lot, that a whole lot in the way of height changes are proposed. It, it's gonna be more, uh, I would expect it to be more selective in trying to find locations where you can accommodate additional height without impacting the adjacent neighbors but that's part of this process that we're starting on is to ask questions like this and so it's good to hear that that views are of a concern okay thank you that answers my question you can move on sorry i didn't I echo the concern about the commercial property changes, where those changes happen, the property taxes are going to go up to reflect the commercial zoning. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry, whoever is speaking, please identify yourself. I'm sorry, Kat Sarenson. I actually called in about the Ruby Creek sub area, but it, it pertains across that, you know, when zoning changes, there's property tax issues. And the concern is if planning is being done, the residents should know that if zoning changes, they might be facing um, quite drastic changes in their property taxes. And so has that been considered? 
So there has been no proposed zoning change at this time. We're only in the initial stages of preparing a plan. And so if you have specific concerns about a specific area, that's something that you can comment on as we go through this process. Um, if, if you are wanting to not have a particular area uh, have its zoning change, but I don't know that there's any area in particular where we're actually seeking a, a zoning change at this time. So, um, Tamara, was that you that was trying to speak earlier? Um, yeah. Um, can, you, can you please state your name and your address, please? Okay, my name is Tamara Peterson and I'm at 1010 Bay Street. And I'm probably one of the only residences on Bay Street, maybe a few others. So my concern is um, what will happen to any residences that are within these um, areas as far as, you know, going from residential to commercial possibly. And would that be eminent domain? So any, any residence that legally exists today can be maintained in perpetuity. Um, it is possible that some sites could be identified for um, zoning changes that would allow for redevelopment, but there's no, there's no eminent domain associated with it. And I believe that um, in, in some parts of the United States, uh, local governments use eminent domain to consolidate properties for private development. That is not something that occurs in Washington under our constitution. So we are not going to be buying properties to redevelop them. We're only creating the conditions so that if an owner chooses, they can sell their property or choose to redevelop it um, if it makes sense to them. Okay, so are there developers that are looking, I, I haven't had, never had anybody approach me, but looking to do things different with a residential property downtown where they may be looking to put something commercial on it that you know of? There are no specific developers that I'm talking to about developing on any of these sites. Near, near the Kitsap Bank property, there is a separate effort associated with the city planning a community event center and some redevelopment on the uh, near city hall between the, the Kitsap Bank and Frederick Street in that general area. Um, but in other parts of downtown, uh, Bay Ford, um, they have permits to, to redevelop the car dealership as a, a new car dealership. Um, but that's been put on hold is my understanding. Um, but, but there's no specific developer that's driving this. this um, and to answer an earlier question, um, I believe from uh, Ms. Harmon, uh, this project started because we received a grant from the Department of Commerce and that grant was funded by the legislature is uh, the legislature gave awards of $50,000 to various cities to study and, and implement changes to provide additional affordable housing and to try to address housing affordability throughout the region. So one of the things that you can do with that money is prepare a sub area plan to try to figure out where additional growth can take place. And so we are studying that issue right now because it is a legislative uh, priority. Um, we have complete control over which direction this goes it's not being pushed by a developer, it is being pushed by the city in conjunction with the Department of Commerce and the funding source. Um, the project, we only got $50,000 from the state. We, the city had to chip in quite a bit um, to, to cover the entire cost of doing this study, which includes a pretty robust outreach process. I mean, this is the first of, um, this is the first meeting that our consultants have attended other than presenting that market study to the Economic Development Committee. This is the first public meeting we're having in a series of public meetings. So um, there, there haven't been public meetings other than me updating the Planning Commission or the City Council telling them that, hey, we're getting ready to do this or this is where we're at in the, the planning process. So we're at the beginning in terms of public involvement and this scoping process is really the opportunity for the public to comment on which direction this, uh, this study and the, the planned action EIS should go. Thank you. That was- I, that I, have, I have a question. This is Dana Harmon at 824 Kitsap Street. And um, I'm just curious since, you know, a lot of this is to make more affordable housing in the Port Orchard, the city of Port Orchard, is there any affordable housing 
projects uh, on online or part of this study for uh, McCormick Woods, or is it only the older homes that are in the downtown Port Orchard area being affected? Well, I, I guess I would, I, I think what you're saying is affordable housing is not synonymous with low income housing. Affordable housing is defined in state law as somebody making between 80% and 115% of the median income for Kitsap County. And the median income for Kitsap County, I believe for a household of one is $72,000. So the, the housing that we're looking at creating is, is meant to be affordable to the, the middle segment of our, our county's population. Um, in terms of housing at McCormick Woods, I, we have had incentives um, proposed for our, uh, the other centers in the city, which McCormick Woods does have a center designated. They are um, the McCormick North area on the north side of Old Clifton, which is currently being developed right now. That is a quadrant development, which is um, certainly less expensive than what is going into um, into the main part of McCormick Woods. And they also have a multifamily component of McCormick North that is, plan that is planned um, that we should be seeing come in for uh, as an application in a few years. So this is not a, we're putting a certain group or a certain type of housing just downtown. It just, it happens that downtown is a priority for coming up with economic development plans um, because of, it, of its importance to the city. And so, we, we took the grant from the state as an opportunity to look at our downtown and to do more. It's the scope of the project is really more than just affordable housing. It is a complete look at making downtown a better place to live. Thank you, Nick. Is there any other questions or comments? Hearing none. Um, are we ready to move on to business item B to continue our public hearing or Nick or Carrie, did you have something else you wanted to say? I don't. Thank you. No, I think that that's everything uh, on this topic unless the consultants have anything they want to add. I, I guess real quickly. I, um, Mitch, when is the comment deadline on the scoping notice? I believe that's uh, Rich, September, September 4th. Okay. Thank you, Rich. So, so the comment deadline on scoping is September 4th. And so the, we've laid out three alternatives. The first alternative is the, the no action alternative, which means that nothing in the way of our regulations and policies will change. The other two alternatives um, prioritize a more residentially centric option or a mixed use option. And so, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Rich, but this is the opportunity to comment on whether the three alternatives that we're looking at should be changed in any way or, or modified. We're really looking to compare and contrast the alternatives to figure out which alternative or which combination of alternatives is the best fit for, for Port Orchard in its future. So, so you are commenting on the alternatives that we're preparing to, uh, to move forward with. Yes, and also on the elements of the environment, you know, for example, we heard tonight that there's concern about view blockage and we have an aesthetics and view section. And if you have any specific areas you want to have, you know, you're concerned about, you can mention those as well. And if there's another element of the environment you think should be analyzed, you know, you can, you can mention that as well. So and other... Other than the comment deadline on the 4th, is there anything else coming up that the public can be a part of? Well, for the EIS, as I mentioned, when the draft EIS is issued, there will be a, a comment period and a public meeting on the draft EIS. But I believe there may be some other meetings uh, associated with the sub area plan as well. So this goes to Nick or Carrie. Does the does the city have a calendar that is uh, that the public can view that maybe these meetings and deadlines and all of that could be added to? So we you know the general public could come in and look and see if they could attend. 
we, we do maintain a calendar, but some of these dates have not been selected yet. And so the best way to keep in touch is to get on our email list and make sure that you're getting all of the notices that go out. We'll, we'll be mailing additional notices as well, but getting on the email list and visiting the project webpage, we have a, a, a specific page on our website dedicated to the project where we post all of the documents and information about the project. And so that's, that's really the best place to go. Okay. And re real quickly, um, Mitch, can you make me the host um, now? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna share a, a different screen here real quick that's related to some of the comments we had. should be the host now. All right, um, there we go. So I'm gonna share, um, in, in the Port Orchard Municipal Code, there are two maps in our overlay district chapter. This is chapter 20.38, um, and this is uh, 650 and 640. Um, in the downtown area of Port Orchard, we allow either three, four, or five-story buildings, and those heights are shown on the map that is in our code here, and that it's color-coded. So the only location where we allow five-story buildings currently is along Bethel, um, uh, in the ravine, kind of between along Blackjack Creek and below Mitchell. So this is an area where views really aren't significantly obstructed. Everything waterward of Bay Street is limited to three stories because the the upland areas we want to make sure that they have an opportunity for water views as well and so most of the properties on the uphill side of, of bay street allow four stories um, but that's where the downtown height limits currently stand and then also in this chapter in um gotta make sure i'm going the right direction um in 20.38 800 these are the view protection overlay properties and so if you are in one of the properties shown in red here above downtown, these areas, because they're sloping and um, uh, there is a desire from the community to protect views, all of these areas are measured from the uphill elevation for height, and you're only allowed to go 15 feet above the uphill property elevation, but you can go, if you have a particularly steep piece of property, you can still get a three or a four story building, but it's going down the hill rather than going up above the uphill side of the property. So this ensures that uh, the, the hillside remains terraced so that, that views are preserved. So um, we're not proposing to change the view protection overlay district uh, height limitations, but if you are not in one of these two areas or you think something affects you in these areas, um, that's certainly something that you can submit as a comment. And that's, that's all I have. And I, Mitch here, just one last time, I just want to thank everybody for um, the opportunity and I look forward to reviewing everyone's comments and just to reiterate as Nick and Carrie and others have, have mentioned, this is um, the start of our um, recommendations and it's pertinent that we receive your comments um, to help facilitate that and look forward to, to hearing from everyone. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight and, and everybody else that was here that participated. Um, it's really nice to know that there are people that, that do care about the city and, and want to come and listen and see what's happening. And I encourage you to share with your neighbors and let them know about this meeting and that there will be future ones. Um, and I apologize if not everybody got the letter, but hopefully next time we can do better. So. I'd like to move now on to business item B and continue the public hearing for the Ruby Creek neighborhood sub area plan and development regulations. Do you, Nick, do you want me to open the public hearing or do you want to like brief us from what yeah, happened? I was just jotting down some notes, um, reminding myself to follow up on the, the mailing. Um, so last meeting, we had a public hearing on the Ruby Creek sub area plan. And um, 
when that meeting was scheduled, I had intended for that to be a public hearing on both the, the plan and the development regulations, but the notice um, did not reference the development regulations. So we decided to continue the hearing on the plan, but also add the development regulation discussion to that hearing. And at the last meeting, we did have testimony from a number of citizens who attended the meeting. And we also, um, since then, we've received some comments that have been mailed or emailed to the city. And Carrie has provided those to you um, either in the packet or uh, directly via email. And today she also sent out a comment matrix that that uh, all the comments that were received and um, also uh, provided a city response to what we've done to address those concerns. So um, the plan that is before you tonight, we've been talking about this for, for going on a year now, uh, I guess not about nine months. Um, the, the plan proposes to uh, create a, a small neighborhood center along Sydney, Sydney Road Southwest, uh, roughly between Sedgwick and uh, Hubdi Road. And we've identified uh, the infrastructure that is needed to support that in the way of transportation improvements, sewer, water improvements, uh, and other uh, amenities, parks, uh, et cetera. And at the last meeting, the, um, the public comments that were received, um, some of them were more general in nature and others were more specific. And for the specific comments that actually raised a specific um, concern, we have tried to add language to the sub area plan that that specifically addresses those concerns and the the main concerns that I heard about were traffic. And if you look at the plan on um, I'm scrolling to the correct page. So bear with me here. Um, and I apologize that your your packet is 151 pages. I'm uh, struggling to find the right spot here. So on page uh, 27 of the plan, it's I think it's um, page 103 of the packet. Um, there are new goals. It's goal T2 and T3, and then the associated policies T7, T8, and T9. And the, based on the comments that we received, we really wanted to bolster the goals and policies related to number one, continuing to make improving SR uh, 16 and SR-160, the interchange, making that a legislative priority for funding uh, state improvements to the interchange. We also added um, the emphasizing the need to improve Sedgwick Road from Highway 16 to uh, Sedgwick, where we currently have a lot of traffic delays and backups. Um, we also received a comment from one resident who lived, I believe lives off of Berry Lake Road, and they were concerned about the traffic impacts of the plan on residents to the north of the sub area. And so um, we wanted to make sure that um, even though we already have a project to improve Sydney Road Southwest all the way between Tremont and Sedgwick, it does turn into pottery at, when it crosses under 16, but we wanted to make sure that that was in the plan as yes, this is a priority to create a complete street with sidewalks, bike lanes and uh, traffic control crosswalks, other, other types of improvements. And, um, and so that is now a goal uh, of the plan as well. Um, the other concerns that I, I heard a lot about were zoning and the desire to have um, uh, some big box retail type development in the area. And um, currently the zoning of the properties that, that were discussed is commercial corridor, which does allow for single story retail type development, um, but uh, those particular sites, there's some question as to whether there are critical areas there or floodplains. And as we mentioned in a previous meeting, we did include the disclaimers in the plan that says that anything mapped here that shows a critical area is based on the information that we have available to us. It is not based on a critical areas delineation. Um, and so it is for planning purposes only. You have to verify the boundaries of any critical areas as part of any development proposal. So we are not saying that you can't develop that property in a particular way. Um, we're just saying that we're, we're trying to show that we believe there's a, a certain amount of capacity and we're trying to make sure that we have provided infrastructure uh, that can accommodate the growth that, that we show capacity for. 
So um, we, we have tried to make some changes to reflect the concerns that have been expressed. Um, with that, I think the best course of action would be to open this up for a public hearing, uh, for the public hearing to be continued and uh, take public testimony and then the Planning Commission can deliberate and um, staff is, is hoping for a Planning Commission recommendation to approve the plan. Um, but if additional changes are identified, um, uh, we can certainly look at making those or um, continuing this discussion to another date. So Annette, if you wanna open the public hearing, please do so. Okay, so I am going to uh, continue, uh, open the public hearing for the recommendation for the Ruby Creek Neighborhoods of Area Plan and Development Regulations. That was a mouthful. Any comments? Uh, yes, this is uh, Brianne Kelsey here. I'd be happy to speak if um, that's appropriate. Sure, can you tell us who you are or your address? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good evening, commissioners and staff and the community for Port Orchard. Uh, Brianne Kelsey, the uh, address for the par property I'm speaking on behalf of is 4977 Sydney Road. I am a senior direct director of development with uh, the group Tarragon who recently acquired uh, the 18 acre piece that sits at the intersection at the north end of the sub area plan. Um, and just wanted to speak in general on the fact that uh, we have <clears throat> been diligently working over the past year in some efforts with the city as well as the previous owners and team members which is i think john johnson and uh, steve sago during the acquisition of this property previously known i think as the tallman property um the 18 acre site is in fact inside of the uh, sub area plan in the northern portion of the corner of the corridor and we came on board in terms of formally acquiring the site and being involved um, fully vested as, as of this July. So we are actually super pleased to be moving forward on a proposed development, uh, which is modestly, I think, reflected inside of that plan of a 216 unit garden court apartment community that has some supporting amenities, uh, inclusive of a clubhouse and a field house. And while we may be new to the city of Port Orchard and perhaps even the Kitsap Peninsula, um, our uh, 25 year history, 25 year history actually as of last week with uh, development construction and property management speaks to the types of communities we build and we're super excited to be a part of this sub area and a part of um, the city of Port Orchard. I think um, just in general for the rest of the, the folks that might be listening and, and new to Tarragon, um, our approach to multifamily is really the creation of a cohesive community and it is important that um, our residents not only feel a part of the community that's there, but a part of their own community too and calling it home. So we are uh, longstanding neighbors in that respect. Um, we also tend to, uh, we develop, we build, and we will end up being the property manager as well for this particular site. So um, there's a bit of a long-term relationship, I think that's in the making um, on our behalf. So. With that said, just wanted to say we are pleased to be part, probably the newest neighbors on the street right now and um, are supporters of this neighborhood plan and definitely recognize the efforts takes in moving these types of initiatives forward. And um, while we're still working through and understanding many of the details that's inside of the sub area plan, um, just wanted to express the fact that um, we, are, um, we are supportive of the effort. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other comments or questions? Yes, my name is Ron Rice. I live at the corner of uh, Sedgwick and Sydney Roads. And I have a couple of questions, comments. I do have a preface. Up until a few years ago, I attended a lot of the uh, public hearings. And it's been my experience that, uh, that you learn a lot in the crowd around the speaker the people are interacting with each other 
they're identifying what their problems are. They're discussing what they might do to solve those problems. A Zoom type public hearing to me is inadequate. You do not get that interaction with the public. All you have is a person that's talking in the microphone. All the information that people share does not exist. Having gone to one of those meetings and watched some of the common comments made by a, dow a dowdy looking woman, maybe 60 some years old, and you think, okay, what's she gonna say? And then you watch the intelligent comments come out of that person. There are a lot of smart people in South Kitsap. But uh, I, th I think the a Zoom platform ignores that advantage. Anyway, a couple of the questions I do have is uh, uh, Mr. Bond mentioned uh, an upgrade of uh, Sydney Road Southwest, but he didn't say how many lanes they might be proposing. You're gonna go to three lanes or five lanes uh, to, to make it so that there's adequate uh, traffic coverage. Um, I think I can agree with uh, the person from, uh, what was her name, Tarragon? Um, I've lived in the area where I'm at uh, essentially all my life. My grandfather bought it in 1928 and I built my house in 1978. We are in favor of commercial development. It is what the area has become. Uh, it would be uh, uh, dis dishonest to uh, suggest that it can re remain what it is. So we're, we're supporting the idea of development. I was concerned with what I read in the sub area plan that the restrict of the restrictions that might be being imposed. Uh, I've got a little bit better feeling this evening that uh, there's a lot of flexibility. I do have a question of uh, who's going to put the uh, the uh, let's see what do you call it the uh, the the facilities in the improvements for water sewer and so on. Is that something that the city's going to put in, or when a developer comes, the city's going to say, okay. You get to widen the road and put in the sidewalks in all the sewer and the water. I think we've seen that before over on the, on the east of us where the developer just can't afford it. it it's, it's too long before they are going to see a profit. Anyway, I'll hold my tongue now and uh, I'd like to hear some other comments from other folks. Thank you. So is there any other comments or questions? All right. Oh, your, yes. Go ahead. This is Dick Brown. Your name, your name and your address, please. This is Dick Brown. Post office box 609 Port Orchard. And did I annex all this property into the city, got it zoned by the county, and been working on it for about 24 years. As Nick said that you guys have been working on this thing for a year, yet the property were, property people were not notified as long as we don't have restrictions on our commercial property and we can build it uh, in the best interest of the community i really don't have a, a problem what i have a problem with is ignoring the traffic and the, the traffic problem isn't currently solvable in its current state when we did the sydney uh traffic plan um with the sidewalks uh, Mer meridian in the middle so on and so forth the road was planned to go through down by Gray Chevrolet and back out on the Hubdi Road. Of course, that cannot be done right now. Uh, so we do have to find an alternative to go across the creek to provide people to go into shopping and or into the park and ride and then into shopping by going across the creek. If we don't do that, I'm not sure how we're going to solve the traffic problem. I've been working on this forever. And uh, Doug Scrobach came to me and said, Dick, we really need to widen the road when he was doing the back of McCormick and said, we need to, we need to uh, get Sedgwick Road improved so it's halfway decent looking. So when you go in and do the back of the property from McCormick, that we'll have something and we need to make sure that we have enough room to get the people off of Sedgwick and Sydney and onto the freeway, which we can't do now. So that's that's all I have to say. 
Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I do. Okay, state your name and your address, please. Susan Schulteis, 722 Southwest Birch Road. We've been there for over 50 years. And um, I have a lot of concerns talking about somehow crossing the creek as if it was an easy thing that floods big time uh, Ruby Creek into Blackjack um, every winter. And right now the water is very low, the lowest we have ever seen it. And I know it's because of all the different things that have been um, the big development off of um, old uh, Glenwood Road and stuff like that. And um, we're very concerned because we're actually seeing drops in our water table, which we've never seen before, except when we first moved there and we had a hand dug well. But very concerned about that. Very concerned about what you're going to do to Sydney because when we ever get to allow our children to go back to school, um, it is a nightmare to get in and out of Birch at uh, Sydney Glen Elementary in the morning and in the afternoon. And I don't see how, if you're going to have four lanes, how that's going to be working very well because you will not be able to, well, right now, you're smart if you don't make a left, try to make a left-hand turn off of Birch into um, onto Sydney at the school time, because it will take you probably 30 minutes to get across, unless somebody stops everything so you can get across. And I ju we're just very concerned because we have been going down, following Ruby Creek at Long Hovde Road into um, to uh, Blackjack for years, and. So much of the stuff they're talking about is going to really impact it. And I got to tell you, we have our doubts as to whether it's going to be safeguarded the way we are hoping it is going to be. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, is just one of the comments, this is Richard Brown. Currently, four or five of us property owners are creating about a, a hundred acre uh, improvement to Ruby Creek on our properties up above where this lady lives on Birch. And there's a big uh, uh, open space uh, uh, wetland was created by Bob Wildermood uh, that, that cuts down on the water flow to uh, lower Ruby. I'm concerned about the plat coming across uh, Glenwood and that the water is allowed to continue to keep the pond below on the right-hand side filled up so that Ruby uh, can do better. Uh, also on one of the pieces of property, you saw a big um, uh, cross, uh, crossing for the, uh, uh, to save the fish on uh, the Gingery property and it was replanted. It must've cost a ton of money. So there's a lot being done above uh, on Ruby. Okay, is there any other questions or comments? Can I interject with a couple of uh, questions that I forgot to ask? Sure. This is Ron, Ron Rice again. First off, I understand that the uh, state has decided that Highway 160 ends at Highway 16, which of course is, uh, is Sedgwick Road. How does that impact developing along uh, Sedgwick and uh, providing transportation on Sydney Road? Who's going to maintain Sedgwick? Is that turned over to the county or the city? Uh, obviously, it'd be an expensive project. The other question I have is, who came up with the $25 million cost to put a bridge across Blackjack Creek? I was here when they put the bridge across Blackjack Creek for Sedgwick Road, and it didn't cost anything close to a million dollars. Thank you. Nick, you wanna, do you have any comments for any of that? Do you wanna close the hearing first? Oh, sure. Is there any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing for Ruby Creek neighborhood. All right, so I've been taking notes here and I'm gonna to try to touch on the comments that were, um, uh, were made. Uh, first of all, in the plan, um, the road section drawings are on page 25 and 26 and Sydney Road, Southwest is identified to be a three-lane road 
the um, two north-south lanes um, with a center turn lane with uh, landscape islands interspersed. So it, where there are turning movements, there will be turn lanes. And where there are not turning movements, it will have a center landscape island to, to make for an attractive setting. Uh, you'll have bike lanes, uh, landscape strips, and sidewalks throughout the length of the corridor. Um, we will taper the road down to two lanes and slightly narrower sidewalks where it does cross Ruby Creek to minimize the impacts of, uh, we're gonna have to replace the culvert in Ruby Creek because it is already a, a partial barrier. And so we've actually applied for grants to do that. And when we put the road back, we're gonna put it back with sidewalks, but it will be a little bit narrower at that, that location. Um, one of the comments was who's paying for the infrastructure and um, uh, they, they, as they say, development typically pays for development. The city has included many of the projects listed in the plan in our water system plan, our sewer system plan, our transportation plans, um, but they are the basis of our sewer connection fees, our traffic impact fees, and sooner or later we're going to build these projects as the money comes in, we are able to cash flow them. There is also the possibility that the city would, would issue bonds and pay for some of these improvements um, because we would be get we would get reimbursed through um, through the payment of connection fees as the development occurs. But so far, none of these improvements are proposed for bonding. Um, we are planning to design the road improvements on Sydney in the 2021-2022 budget so that we can hopefully pursue grant funding to actually fully build that road with with sidewalks and uh, amenities that will help hopefully remove some barriers to additional future development. Um, there are opportunities for landowners to come together and form a local improvement district and there are two sewer lift station improvements that are going to benefit more than uh, just the one or two property owners. I know Tarragon is planning on building one of those sewer lift stations to serve their apartment complex and that will have some additional capacity um, that could serve other development in the area. Um, that's on the north side of Ruby Creek. The south side is also going to need a sewer lift station and we're going to need an additional sewer force main in Sydney Road uh, heading to the north um, after we get to a certain threshold of development. So all of these improvements add up to 40 or $50 million uh, if they're funded by the city. But what we're doing is we're building these into our, our uh, connection charges, our impact fee charges, so that it is possible for developers to actually get credit against the fees that they owe when they make the improvement and, and develop their property. So, um, so there's, there's no easy answer to providing infrastructure um, and we certainly don't have adequate infrastructure in the area today, but I believe that the plan um, does lay out the, the essential pieces that are needed to support the development that is shown in the plan. As far as Sedgwick Road, um, first of all, that is a city road. Um, everything from SR 16 to the west city boundary is, uh, is the city's responsibility. And so we are on the hook for fixing that. We have certainly been applying for grants and we are um, uh, seeking, we, we do collect impact fee money towards that. So every time a house is built, there's an impact fee that is paid. And some of that money can be used to fund uh, a fix to that road. The, as I mentioned earlier, we did add a goal in our plan that said that we need to um, prioritize adding capacity to Sedgwick Road to get people to and from, uh, to and from SR 16 and also to continue to lobby the state to do something about the interchange. And in, uh, in 2019, in the legislature's capital budget, we did have a project on the list and unfortunately they did not pass that budget, but uh, there was $7 million allocated to install uh, intersection controls at the on and off ramps on the bridge, uh, which was uh, the first step to really in increasing capacity and throughput across SR 16 and on SR-16. We're not even sure uh, at this time whether Sedgwick needs to be widened between Sydney and 16 um, because we haven't seen how the road will actually function with intersection controls um, that are better than what are currently uh, on the overpass. So um, moving on, Ruby Creek, uh, if you look at page five of the plan, um, that's the, the central planning area of the, um, of the sub area. That is, um, we are showing the, the 300 foot, uh, 150 feet on either side of the creek buffer, as well as a park, uh, a public park that is proposed at the confluence of Blackjack and Ruby Creek. And we will be 
including a, a planned park in that area as part of our parks plan and park impact fees will ultimately pay uh, for the, the possible future acquisition of those properties. That area is mostly floodplain, so it, it has limited development potential, um, but it, there's nothing that requires it to become a park. We are just identifying the need to, to place a park in that general vicinity. Um, Sydney and Birch, I, I appreciate that comment. That is not something that we had heard previously. And um, if the Planning Commission is going to recommend the plan tonight, I would recommend adding an additional goal to the sub area plan transportation element uh, that specifically addresses uh, safety improvements at that intersection by the school. Um, crosswalks and sidewalks are already proposed as part of the plan, but I think we should emphasize that intersection's importance and uh, make sure that it is captured in the, the written goals and policies for the plan. So I would suggest that the Planning Commission, if you're, if you're going to vote to recommend this tonight, that you make a motion to add a, for staff to insert a goal uh, prioritizing the intersection of, of Sydney and Birch for improvement as well, just so it is not uh, lost in the, in the uh, details of the plan. So I think that, uh, that is all I had in terms of notes from the public comment portion of the meeting. And if any of the planning commissioners have questions, comments, or uh, would like to discuss this, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Does any of the Planning Commission have any comments or questions? Um, would all of you unmute so we can do a vote? And all of the Planning Commission anyway, unmute. Does somebody want to make a recommendation? Well, yeah, I will. I'd like to, to recommend that we uh, move forward with this program and support the, uh, the uh, Ruby Creek Neighborhood Improvement Plan, sub-area plan, um, with the uh, pretense that uh, Nick talked about with improving the safety around uh, Sydney Glen uh, and that intersection there at Birch, I believe it is. Go ahead and second that, Mark. Uh, I think that it's important. I appreciate everybody's time tonight. And what we've been talking about is how can we make our community more attractive uh, to both live in and grow as time passes. And I think um, the planning commission, uh, or at least the, the planning department, Nick and Carrie have done an amazing job, particularly, particularly on Ruby Creek. And I wanna thank everybody for their time and participation. And can I have you clarify your motion, Mark? Because we're actually recommending an ordinance to adopt both the Ruby Creek sub area plan with the Birch Road intersection policy uh, addition, as well as the regulations that implement the Ruby Creek plan, which are part of the ordinance in your packet tonight. So how would you like me to state that, Nick? I understand what you're saying. I just don't understand how to, how to say it. Uh, I think you could say that um, I would like to amend my motion to uh, to be a recommendation to the city council to adopt the ordinance uh, as presented in our packet with the addition of a, a goal related to the Birch, uh, Birch Road intersection. All right, I'll try that one. I would <laughs> like to recommend the Ruby Creek Neighborhood Siberia Plan as, as uh, presented in our packet with a uh, caveat added to it to improve, look at a way, method of improving the uh, safety and traffic at the Birch Creek and, or at the Birch Road and Sydney Glen intersection. I'll continue to second Mark, but I won't, I won't attempt to do that tongue twister. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, there you go, Nick. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Nick. You. Thank you everyone for your comments too. It was, it was greatly appreciated. So now we're gonna move on to uh, business item letter C, the Shoreline Master Program update, impacts of sea level rise on city shoreline. And uh, if I can just introduce our consultants, 
I think they're still out there somewhere. Um, we have Andrea McClellan and Jeff Parsons, um, both with Herrera Environmental Consultants. And they're here today to talk about um, the first phase that we're undertaking for our Shoreline Master Program update. We are required to update our Shoreline Master Program or SMP every seven years by the Department of Ecology. And this is one of the periodic updates that we're doing in 2020, 2021, where we have to look at our existing SMP and identify any weaknesses in our plan, as well as any areas where we're inconsistent with um, state law, outdated, that kind of thing, or where we need to update our best available science. And so one of the things that we're aware of, um, especially for our downtown shoreline, is the vulnerability that the city has for climate change and sea level rise over the next few decades. Um, as most people probably know, we already have some issues in our downtown because it's both very low lying and it's primarily built on fill. And so, you know, we even have buildings where the tide comes in under them um, on the water side of Bay Street. So we already have issues with um, flooding downtown at high tide, king tide events, and wind-driven storm surges. And so we contracted with Herrera to provide a picture for us of our downtown and its vulnerability um, over the next couple of decades for sea level rise and how that could affect both our existing development downtown and our development potential downtown and how um, we could best adjust our planning and policy recommendations in the SMP to best address those potential issues. And so I will let um, um, Andrea and Jeff introduce themselves, um, if you can want to put the name with the face. And they have a presentation tonight to go over their report, which was sent to you. And that also um, followed up on a report which they assisted on for Kitsap County, which provided some climate change recommendations for Port Orchard as well, but got deeper into the details specifically for our downtown shoreline. And that's what we wanna focus on is our downtown um, and what we need to do to make sure that as we plan for its future and for any new development downtown, that um, we don't put something that's going to be in harm's way because of rising seas. So um, Andrea, Jeff, um, it's, it's yours. And Nick, if, do you want to give them, um, Andrea or Jeff, who would like control of the screen? Oh, I have the presentation loaded up. All right, I'm going to make you host here. Just bear with me. Can I just share my screen? You can now because you're the host. <laughs> OK, great. I am unfamiliar with the Zoom platform. OK. Now I just have to get the... Uh... All right, we, we are seeing the, the main page of the presentation now. Okay, I'm just making some minor adjustments so I can see the right things while I'm presenting. Okay, well, um, thanks again for having us here to present on our recent work for the Port Orchard Marine Shorelines. My name is Andrea McLennan. I'm a coastal geomorphologist with Herrera Environmental Consultants. And also on the phone is Jeff Parsons, who is a, uh, an engineer, a senior engineer with the company. So generally, and generally, the objective of our work for the city of Port Orchard entailed the following elements. Uh, we wanted to identify the areas most affected by sea level rise in the Port Orchard Marine Shorelines and specifically the downtown area. We were um, going to evaluate current flood hazards, identify vulnerable infrastructure to sea level rise, and uh, review the current code related to flood regulations and sea level rise and provide recommendations for code revisions and additional regulations and provide recommendations for next steps and future management of these hazards. So as you can see from this historical map of the downtown Port Orchard shoreline from the late 1800s, the, the marine shoreline has incurred a lot of changes over the years. The current shoreline is shown in a blue dashed line over um, the historic shoreline, which is this 
this black line and underneath it you can kind of see a little bit of an air photo base you can kind of see what is there today and how much of the historical shoreline um, has been filled and um, this area these areas here with this this texture this cross hatching hopefully you can see my cursor um, these are coastal wetlands so these would have been areas that were covered by um, estuarine vegetation so um, roughly 98 percent of the shoreline within port orchard is currently armored and and many of these areas are also filled as we've been talking about so by filled, we mean that, that uh, material has add, been added to what was once intertidal area to add elevation and in some cases convert it to um, upland areas and develop it. So we know that extensive coastal wetland areas have been filled and that is now, uh, now there's extensive shoreline development overlying those areas with uh, many coastal roads along the downtown shoreline and um, several contaminated areas. So to, to reach our objectives, we created what's commonly referred to as a bathtub model of sea level rise, where essentially we were just raising the elevation of um, the, the current shoreline to match uh, different sea level rise projections and the 100 year flood event. For our sea level rise projections, we used the, the most recent projections from the Washington State Coastal Resilience Project, which was funded just in 2018 by the EPA and led by the Department of Ecology and University of Washington's climate impact groups. Um, the sea level rise projections that, um, that we used are referred to as uh, probabilistic projections. And each of the different projections is tied to the probability that it's likely to occur. Projections with a higher probability are typically lower measures of sea level rise um, that are more certain to occur across a given time, say by 2040. And in contrast, the lower probability projections are typically higher measures of sea level rise and they're associated with lower levels of certainty. So try to keep that in mind as we look through these maps. So you may be asking, you know, why, why should you care about these projections? And the reason is that this is the standard method and these projections are, have been accepted by the state government and will likely be used for the basis of future state regulations related to sea level rise. So um, these are Im important for knowing that you're doing the right thing along your shoreline. So we started the effort off by evaluating the absolute sea level rise projections for Washington state. These projections account for both ocean expansion and some ice sheet melt from the West Antarctic ice sheet and Greenland. Here you can see um, in this table, the, the range of probabilities across different time periods, the 10% probability exceedance is much greater than the, it's much more likely to occur than the 1% probability exceedance. And you can see that these, these measures here, these sea level rise projections at 10% are lower than those at 1%. So these are, these are higher projections. This is the number of feet of sea level rise that you will see within this timeline. So between 2040 and 2050, the 10% probability is one foot and the 1% probability is 1.3 feet. So this is what we started with. And then um, we needed to take into account lo local vertical land movement to produce the relative sea level rise projections. So kind of specific projections for Port Orchard. So there, as part of the sea level rise projection effort that was done by the state, they did a, a, a new vertical land movement assessment to um, kind of apply locally adjusted uh, vertical land movement estimates um, for various areas, including uh, Port Orchard or Bremerton. Um, vertical land movement in general moves at a very slow pace, but can change uh, more dramatically during seismic events where there's a lot of uplift or subsidence. 
So these were the sea level, the relative sea level rise projections that that were that we mapped, and you're going to see these slides uh, coming up here in a couple of minutes. And this is the the 99% probability of exceedance. So it's it's going to happen <laughs> in 2040 was reportedly zero. 50% uh, probability of exceedance is half a foot. 1% probability is 1.1 feet, and so on and so forth. Um, and then I should I should uh, also report here on the upper end of the range here for 2100. Um, now there is more uncertainty associated with um, these higher projections here. That's important to keep in mind. But it is generally you know 99% probability of ex exceedance that we're going to see uh, a third of a foot um, by 2100, and a 50% chance that we will see 2.1 feet by 2100 and the 1% probability exceedance that we will see a um, five foot rise in sea level by 2100. So that is the most uncertain. So this slide really shows the overall trends of different carbon emission scenarios and the probabilistic relative sea level rise projections across different 10 year periods up until 2100. And this is specific to the Port Orchard area. Um, so you can see that, that even though we may be looking at different projections for 2040 and 2100, overall, the trend is that the sea levels will keep rising and, and actually beyond 2100, beyond what's, what's uh, displayed here in this figure. So um, next, we took a look at the water level data from the local Seattle tide gauge and compared those data with the city of Bremerton's local tidal benchmark, which was pretty old and unfortunately didn't really represent the current tidal epoch. Um, then we identified the elevation of the 100-year flood for Seattle and adjusted that value based on the difference between uh, mean high or high water in Seattle and in Bremerton, and then converted the elevations to the local tidal datum of uh, NAVD 88. And what we found is that the 100 year flood elevation in that datum is 12.77 feet for the 100 year flood. And so we added in our mapping exercise, we, we added our sea level rise projections our relative sea level rise projections, pardon me, that last table of numbers that you saw to this value to fully understand the upper limits of future flood events. Is that that's how we can avoid risks in the future by planning conservatively. Okay, so this is one of our mapping results. And I know it's, or one of our maps uh, of the downtown area. And I know it's, it's very busy. To, um, to look at initially um, as a start, just go over here to the legend and start familiarizing yourself with the gradient of different projections. What's shown in blue is the 100 year uh, flood event. And I just wanna remind everyone that this is just a coastal flood. This doesn't include flooding from you know, heavy precipitation upland areas. Um, next, uh, in the color gradient here with the green, you see the 100-year flood plus the 50% probability of sea level rise projections for 2040. Um, so you can see how um, each of these blue areas it kind of expand further a little more with the green and then again a little bit more with the yellow. The yellow represents the 100 year flood plus the 1% probability of sea level, uh, sea, probability sea level rise projections for 2040. So there's less certainty, but it's a higher projection. And then um, the red represents the 100 year marine flood plus the 50% probability sea level rise projection for 2100. So that is, um, that is kind of like the um, uh, looking furthest out, but a relatively certain projection for this area that these, these areas are likely um, to be flooded by 2100. Or there's a 50% chance that they will be based on the current science. So, um, 
So really the uncertainty that that represents is really just what year that those areas will be flooded rather than if they will be flooded. So after we mapped these different projections, we evaluated the maps and took a look at um, the inundated stormwater structure structures, pardon me, that are that are actually shown here in these purple dots. These are all um, different kinds of catch basins and other stormwater structures that will be affected by sea level rise. Those ones in orange will not be, at least based on our mapping exercise. Um, here we're looking at the mapping results for Blackjack Creek where um, there's currently extensive flooding um, within the historic estuary as it was, um, a lot of it is his filled historical wetlands. And also quite a bit of um, inundated stormwater structures you can see here kind of surrounding that historical estuary. Um, the, um, the salt water is expected to kind of penetrate in further landward um, within the, the Black, Jack, Black Jack Creek um, channel. And that is likely to result in some additional uh, changes to that area. Um, though there will be kind of more, more salt tolerant, a transition to more salt tolerant vegetation within this area. There may be some additional downed trees as a result of kind of a shift to more estuarine conditions. Uh, slope stability in the ravine and the adjacent um, slopes will likely be affected. Um, there are several deep seated landslides mapped in this ravine. There are high hazard areas in the, um, the CAO. Um, but, it, but areas like this where there's a, a road right adjacent to um, the, the crest of the ravine um, will likely see additional changes and increased precipitation associated with climate change may also kind of contribute to accelerated um, mass wasting in these areas. Okay, so here we are um, near Annapolis and you can see uh, many different inundated stormwater structures as well as extensive flooding over Bay Street kind of currently as well as that that trend kind of continuing in the future with sea level rise and um, um, considerable flooding of uh, Arnold Creek. Um, inundation of the West Sound wastewater treatment facilities will largely be focused around the creek mouth. It kind of reaches into the facility's um, land and, um, and then as well as some overtopping of Beach Road um, further east of the facility. Uh, several stormwater structures are also likely to be inundated over time in this area, uh, particularly by 2100. So we learned quite a bit about the relative vulnerability of the stormwater structures in Port Orchard, which are located both on uh, private and publicly owned land. You can see the summary table really kind of highlights um, the, the number of different outfalls that are found within you know, public and privately owned land. and. Um, whether or not they're isolated or connected to the marine water. For areas that are connected to the marine water, it may be practical to install tide gates and um, there may be other, um, other solutions for areas that are isolated from marine waters. But generally, this is, this is a great opportunity for applying some proactive management. Um, and it also could be useful for developing funding strategies for adapting and retrofitting this infrastructure. Uh, roads were another major issue um, that we just needed to bring back as a result of this exercise. Uh, several roads have also been identified by WashDOT in the area as being high risk or highly vulnerable to sea level rise. So it may be worth reaching out to the local folks at WashDOT to see if there are opportunities to collaborate see when they will be adding elevation to those roads, et cetera. Um, it's also important to note that some of the armor waterward of Bay Street is in poor condition 
and we'll need additional freeboard to sustain um, floods and prevent additional overtopping and flooding. Um, our regulatory recommendations, recommendations <laughs> emphasize the need to formally adopt the 2017 updated firm mapping and to revise um, the shores of all of the shores of Port Orchard to be located in the um, high or the coastal high hazard areas and um, acknowledge the liquefac liquefaction risk due to the fill over coastal wetlands um, in the downtown area. Uh, there were several additional um, more general recommendations that we also provided and I'll just kind of conclude with. Uh, we just want to encourage folks to manage for the long term as sea level rise will continue beyond 2040 or 2100, whatever uh, projections <clears throat> that you're looking at. Uh, to apply for, for funding to support adaptation and hazard mitigation, there's a lot of uh, unique funding sources available for uh, small cities. Uh, to create a stormwater comprehensive plan for, for creating action around the, the threatened stormwater infrastructure. Um, evaluate armor conditions in areas with known contaminants and pr prioritize those areas for action. Um, if the, the armor fails where there's landward contaminants, those contaminants will go right onto your beaches and could have big effects on the ecosystem. Um, we encourage folks to form partnerships um, in the sea level rise adaptation community particularly reaching out to WashDOT to support um, shared roads and uh, to develop sea level rise standards for the downtown waterfront redevelopment and to integrate adaptation uh, into long-term planning wherever possible. So that is my uh, last slide and I'm happy to answer any questions and Jeff is also here on the phone. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Can you um, pass me the hosting back to me when you're done with this so I can uh, end the recording at the end of the meeting? Yes. You just have to hover over my picture, the three dots, and hit uh, um, make host. Okay. I just have to, oh, there you are. Hover over the three dots. Okay. I have a question. Uh, yeah. I'm Pat. I live at 1710 Guy Wetzel Road. Um, so is all this water rise a prediction due to climate change? Yes, the sea, the sea level rise yeah. yes, is associated with climate change. And so you're basing that on, on um, predictions of climate change having an effect on water rising generally over the next hundred years. Yeah, yeah, based on thermal expansion rates and um, the uh, melting that's been documented in Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was just like wondering where um, those figures were coming from. Yeah, generally from the University of Washington, which also I think used some of the same climate models as the IPCC. Okay, yeah, we're going to lose some roads. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, I had one. Um, thanks for the presentation, Andrea. I'm Phil with the Planning Commission. I just had, I was curious about the Rockwell Avenue. Um, it was cited on there. I didn't really understand what the concern was there at Rockwell. Okay. Well, um, it's, it's just uh, right adjacent to the ravine where there's um, the, you know, that's adjacent to, to Blackjack Creek and at that corner where it, um, Rockwell bends okay. to the left over to Kitsap Street. It's kind of really the meeting of those two. So up at the top, streets. more of a landslide issue than yes. down towards the bottom. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. More okay. of a landslide issue. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely no sea level rise all the way up there on the bank. And so it's so funny that like the sun set while I was presenting and now I'm sitting in the dark for you guys. That's a little odd. <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> Is there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight and explaining this to us.
Um, and so Nick, where do we go from here with, with this project? Carrie is going to have to remind me of our next step. She's been managing this project more than I have. Um, our next step is that based upon the information that Herrera has provided to us, um, which is currently under review by the Department of Ecology, we're just waiting for feedback from them um, on the science and the recommendations that have been provided. Uh, I expect to get it kind of a, a, um, answers from Ecology within the next week or so, hopefully. Um, we will be providing a draft policy changes and um, code changes to our SMP. Uh, we're gonna be doing other updates to our SMP besides just responding to climate change, but it appears that climate change will be the, the main issue, the main real substantive issue that we're going to be dealing with in this SMP update. And so what we're going to do is provide an initial draft of those changes um, to the, I'm sorry, are you, are you sharing your screen again or? No. Oh, it's okay. No, it was just, um, a, it was just returning it back. Okay. Um, we will be going ahead to, to prepare our recommendations for the SMP changes to policy recommendations and code. And we will be um, circulating those for public review. We'll have them on our website and we're going to be notifying all of our downtown and shoreline property owners of these findings so they can review the science and the proposed changes for themselves. And we'll be initiating um, a series of public meetings. Uh, the schedule that we have right now is to bring forth those draft code changes for planning commission review in November. That would be the first meeting. And so that will be open to the public. It's not a public hearing, but it will just be a presentation of those recommendations to you for you to um, review and to get your feedback and to just get started on that process. And it will be the first of several meetings for the SMP. Like I said, this is just the this is just dealing with the one issue of climate change. There will be other changes to the SMP, but because this is the the, the biggest issue, we want to go ahead and get most deeply into that and um, get your feedback on that as soon as possible, and also keep an ecology involved as we move along. Will we be getting a letter about these next meetings, like we did this one? Um, how, which, which meeting did you come here for downtown? or got a letter here just talking about the just general development plans. And it, hey, that's how I knew about this. I got this letter and it had the link and stuff. And I was just wondering if we were going to get another letter for any other meetings. Well, I'm not sure how you, I, I couldn't really see your letter, but I tell you what, if you want to be kept at, um, apprised of what's happening with the SMP, please just send me your name um, and contact info to planning at cityofportorchard.us, and I'm happy to add you to the SMP mailing list. Okay, that's probably sure not get you. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yes. For, spe for specific notices for things affecting the downtown shoreline, we would normally be sending to everyone within the shoreline zone, which is 200 feet from the, the, the shoreline. ordinary high water mark. And then we'll probably expand that back several hundred feet as well. Um, but we want everyone who's interested in what's going on with the SMP to be on that mailing list as well. So just send me your information. I'll make sure you get all future meeting notices. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? before we wrap it up. All right. See, none. You. Go ahead, what? What? Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Okay, I'm going to adjourn the meeting for Tuesday, September 1st, 2020. Thank you everyone for coming. It was good seeing everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.